Hi, good morning, everyone. Today is May 4th, Monday morning. I just woke up. I bet you guys did too. Hope you guys had a good weekend. Um, anyways, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, the first thing I wanna get started with is just checking in with you guys. Um, and one of the things I wanna check in with you guys is um, with this following question here. And this is the question. So as human beings, um, it's really important that um, one of the ways that we um, combat depression or one of the ways that we need to live as human beings is to always look forward to something. Um, and I know during these times, it's hard to know what to look forward to or have something in mind, especially when a lot of things are closed and we have so many restrictions. Um, but yet it's, um, we could always be creative with finding something to look forward to, whether it's something small or something big, um, but they're all significant. So I just wanna give you guys a chance to kind of think about this question, what is something you look forward to this week? And I'm gonna call on the um, call on folks to um, share your answer. Um, I'll start off. What is something you look forward to this week? Um, so my, um, my, I have an avocado tree in the back so um, my kids and I, my mom and dad, yesterday were picking out an avocado tree from the avocados, um, picking avocados from the tree, and there were so many. And uh, my kids are entrepreneurs, so they're like, let's sell them, mommy. So we're gonna have an avocado drive through stand <laughs> this week, and we're gonna um, just kind of set up a stand on the front and pre-bag everything, um, and give a chance for the kids to be able to make a little bit of cash for the toys. Um, and learn how to count money and I'll just invite people to come over for an avocado sale. So that's something I'm looking forward to this week. Um, let's go ahead and how about Victor? What is something you look forward to this week? Victor, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I can hear you. I'm just trying to think of what I'm looking forward to this week. Do you want to skip for now and I'll come back to you? Yeah, can you? Sure. Um, Stephanie. Um, passing my exam. Which class? Um, political science. Ooh. Yeah. Right. Good luck to you with that. Thank you. And I like your attitude, passing your exam. <laughs> like Thank you. Uh, Melissa. Um, oh, um, it's my friend's birthday on Wednesday. And I haven't seen them in a really long time, uh -huh. even before quarantine. So she's going to have like this, um, like drive by. So that's the closest to that I would get to seeing her. So I guess I'm excited for that. Oh, that's awesome. What city does she live in? In Wilmington. Wilmington. Okay. Um, I don't know if you knew, um, I put on my Facebook, but my son, we had a drive by birthday party for him and I caught the, um, the fire department and the police department, and they came by and sang happy birthday. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Yeah, and people came with signs and all that. So I hope you have a good time seeing your friend in that special way. Sophia. Um, uh, I guess just the weekend. What do you look forward to doing during the weekend? Uh, getting assignments out of the way because I have a lot of bigger assignments coming up. Mm. So you're juggling a lot of stuff, it sounds like. Mm hmm Anthony. Uh, um, I don't really know right now. Okay, you want to skip for now? Yeah. Okay. Um, how about Ashley? Um, well, the other day, uh, I went to Costco with my brother, and we decided to buy water balloons. Water balloons? Yeah, so we bought, like, two, like, big packs. Uh -huh. So hopefully this weekend, uh, we get to use them. No, oh, that sounds so much fun. Ronaldo? Um, just for some shoes I bought online, I guess. Should be getting them at the end of the week. Oh, that's right. You're really into shoes. What kind of shoes did you get? Some Nike shoes. Cool. Yeah, it's like getting a present in the mail, right? When you order something. <laughs> yeah. Good. Uh, Margo. 
Um, tomorrow, my mom and I are making margaritas and getting tacos. Cinco de Mayo. Yeah. Awesome. Are you? Where are you getting your tacos? Um, it's this taco place in Long Beach here in Cal State Long Beach called Great Mex. Okay. And they have tacos Tuesdays, and they have really good tacos. Awesome. That's, and you make your own margaritas? Yeah, my mom bought, like, the mix and, like, the tequila, and so we're going to make our own margarita. Awesome. Yeah. Good for you guys. Yeah, I was thinking yeah. of Cinco de Mayo. It's like, what? You should be doing something. <laughs> yeah. Great. I'm glad. Um, Paul, how about you? Um, I plan on just getting as much sunshine as I can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How are you getting your weather's getting, The weather's getting really nice out there. So. Right, right. Is there anywhere you're hoping to go to be out, out in the sun or any special place? I might try to take a walk near the beach. I don't want to break any laws. So, oh. um, you know, I'm trying to comply with this. But uh, the weather's getting really nice, so it makes us to get out there. Good. I've been going on a lot of hiking trails, and it's absolutely amazing the flowers are coming out it's blooming the weather's crisp so yeah enjoy paul let me know where you end up going hope you enjoy yourself thank you you too um victor back to you oh um i was looking forward to finishing a drawing that i was doing for my class okay what are you drawing it's original composition for it's like a color one so i had to draw like a scenery with well basically with color but it's it's like selective it's like we only have like 12 colors to choose from oh very cool well when you finish hopefully you can show it to us i'd like to see it all right if you feel comfortable <laughs> yeah <laughs> feel free to show it um whenever you finish if you want Anthony, how about you? Uh, well, I have a lab exam, so I'm looking forward to passing that. And I, I'm also getting some shoes in the mail. Cool. And what shoes are those? Uh, some Russell Westbrook shoes. He's a basketball player. OK. Very cool. Um, Hannah, welcome to the Zoom. We are just answering this question. What is something you look forward to this week? Um, today is my friend's 21st birthday, so um, she's coming over and we're going to hang out and play games and stuff like that. So, Awesome. Wow, the big 2-1. I know. <laughs> well, it's legally, is it voting? Is that what happens when you're 21? Or is that drinking? I forgot. Drinking. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Well, happy birthday to your friend. Awesome. Well, you know what? That's, I know, you know, when I asked that question, some of you guys were probably caught off guard, but just um, for your own um, health and your own mental health and whatnot and your own joy, um, just make sure you have something even for that day to look forward to that day, maybe something to look forward to that week. And if there, there isn't anything to look forward to, create something. Um, whether it's something, you know, small or something big, um, it doesn't have to be anything crazy, but it's really cool to look forward to something. So thank you for sharing with me. Um, at this point, I just want to open up the floor for any questions that you guys might have. Oops, sorry. Um, any questions for, from anyone about anything, about the exam, about the material we just had, about the class? Questions or comments? Uh, I have a question on the Class just Garrett's Discord. Like, what? How do we know? How do we get on there? Oh, Garrett's Discord. Um, there was a, a link that he um that was sent out. Um, <clears throat> I'll I'll go ahead and put it on our um. What do you call it? Let me find it real quick. I'll go ahead and put it on our chat room so you guys can see. Um, this is. Let me share my screen real quick. This is his Discord website or um, link. You could go on it on your phone or on your or on your um, your computer. Discord.gg forward slash e5txmbw. 
if you download or if you just click on that, um, then you'll be able to go directly to, I, I think you might have to download the app, I'm not sure. Um, and then you'll be able to connect with him and um, you'll see him on video and he'll be there for you. Thank you. Okay, All right. good question. Yeah, I really hope you guys utilize um, Garrett because he's totally wanting to help you guys as much as possible. Any other questions? I have a question. Um, can you do another example for um, chapter eight on number seven? Chapter eight, number seven. Was, chapter, can you tell me which, because um, you guys are both in uh, math 130. Math 130, chapter eight. Is that functions or what's Yeah. That? Okay, number seven, sure. So that's on, okay, composite questions. All right. Anyone else have any questions before I go ahead and answer that one? All good in the hood? All right. Hold on one second. All right, so let's answer this question, com composition of two functions. So we have the F function and the G function, and they are asking us for F composite G of X. So they're asking us for F composite G of X. So another way of writing that is F on the outside, and then on the inside is the inner function. So the inner function would be G of X. So this is the inner. The second one is always the inner, and the first one is always the outer. So outer and then the inner. So the first thing I would do then is, <clears throat> I would look at the inside first, because remember order of operations, you always do the parentheses starting from the inside. So from starting from the inside here, um, my inside is g of x, and what is g of x? It's square root of x plus three. So I'm gonna put square root of x plus three for g of x, because that's what it is. Is everyone okay with that? All right, and then now I'm going to evaluate the outer function. So when I evaluate the outer function, this is my function. So f, so it calls out this function here, f. It calls this function, and then they're asking us to put in or to input square root of x plus 3. So this input is square root of x plus 3. So wherever I see my input in the function, I'm going to plug in the square root of x plus 3. So here in this, I'm gonna say this is equal to, I call out my function, hey, f function, come on down. So here's four, and then x, well, it's, the input is x, so since our input is now square root of x plus three, I'm gonna put square root of x plus three. So four times the input, and then minus three. Is that okay? Any questions on that? All right, feel free to stop me at any point if something looks confusing. Okay, now after that, I'm gonna go ahead and simplify that. And I just do four multiplied by radical. Well, when you multiply by radical, you just leave the number outside and then you have the radical inside and there it is. So this is four square root of x plus three minus three is the answer. Now, next they ask us to find the domain. So they asked us to find the domain of F composite G. Is there any point where you guys can't see the, um, the thingamajigger, the, the sheet? Just let me know. So they asked me to find the domain of F composite G. Well, this is F composite G. So this is F composite G, the domain then. So when I look at this, I ask myself, are there any restrictions? Are there any restrictions to this. And if it was a fraction, we know that restrictions of a fraction is that you can't have a zero in the denominator. Well, are there any restrictions with a radical? And the answer is yes. With a radical, does anyone know what the restriction of a radical is? What can you not have inside of a square root radical? A negative? Yes. So good, so you cannot have a negative inside of a radical. So are there any restrictions? You cannot have a negative radicand. 
so radican is um, the the whatever's inside the radical. So you cannot have a negative in there. So therefore, we know that the restriction is that x plus 3, the radicant, must be greater than or equal to 0. So x plus 3 must be greater than or equal to 0. It can equal to 0. That's why I put it greater than or equal to, because it's OK to have a 0 inside the radical sign. It's just that you can't have a negative. So now when I solve for oh, x. I have a question. Go ahead. So why is it uh, greater, greater than or equal to again? Oh, because um, the radicand is x plus 3. And it has to be greater than because it has to be positive. Right? Okay. x plus 3 has to be positive. It can't be negative like you just said. And why is it uh, equal to? OK, great question. Because it's OK to have a 0 in the radical sign. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's okay to have, you can have a zero in the radical sign and that's A-OK. -okay. So the only restriction is that you can't have it be negative. So if it can't be negative, that means it could be positive and it could be zero. Does that make sense? Yeah, so if it's, so if it's a negative three, then what would happen? If what is a negative three? The X minus three in the radical. Oh, if this was an X minus three in here? Yeah. Okay, let me do, let me finish this and I'll go back to your what if, Anthony. So let's finish this problem first and then we'll go to the what if. So the inside the radical is square root of x plus 3. So x plus 3 has to be positive. It has to be positive, it has to be, and, and it's okay for it to be greater than, to be equal to 0. So that's for that. So now when I solve for this, I get x, I subtract 3 on both sides. So I get x is greater than or equal to, sorry, negative 3. So this is the domain. The domain has to be that x is greater than or equal to negative 3. So for an example, if I plug negative 3 in here, negative 3 plus 3 gives me 0. That's OK, right? Square root of 0 just gives me 0. If I plug in a number bigger than negative 3, say I plug in negative 2, if I plug negative 2 in here, I get negative 2 plus 3. That'll give me a positive 1. That's OK. Square root of positive 1 will give me a 1. But if I plug in a number less than negative 3, say I plugged in negative 4, if I plug negative 4 in here, notice you get negative 4 plus 3 will give me negative 1, which is not OK, because you cannot have a negative inside a radical. And that's why x is greater than negative 3 is the domain. And they ask you to write it in interval notation. So interval notation is in terms of a window. So if you drew, drew this in terms of a graph, this is a negative 3. x is greater than negative 3 means a solid circle, negative 3, and everything to the right. So when you do this, the interval notation is this window here. The left-hand side is negative 3. The right-hand side is infinity. And since it's a closed circle, negative 3 includes negative 3, we do a closed bracket on negative 3, open bracket on infinity, because infinity always gets open bracket. So therefore, this becomes your domain. Any questions on that? Did that answer your question? Yeah, I did. Thank you. Good, good, OK. Any other questions? I'm glad you asked. Any other questions besides composition of two functions? All righty. So let's go ahead and move on. Um, last week, last week we um, worked on functions and exponentials. That's where we were at. Um, we finished about, let's see, we finished eight topics on this. Um, I asked you guys to do as much as you guys can by Sunday so that tonight you only, we only have like five or six topics to go through. And this is going to be due on Tuesday night. So if you notice on Alex, I changed the, um, the due date to Tuesday night for all 13 topics. And hopefully by now you've already done eight. So you only have about um, six more to go. So we talked about shifting graphs. We talked about uh, yeah, shifting graphs again, shifting graphs again. So if you go into college algebra, there'll be a lot of shifting of graphs. But then we talked about functions. And with functions, we learn how to add, subtract, and multiply. And it's really not too, too hard because you just 
Um, it's just being, un being able to understand the notation and then rewriting it so that you understand, oh, that's just multiplication. That's just subtraction. That's just adding. And then we learned how to do division. And then we talked about domain, especially with division, there's always a domain because whenever you have a fraction, there's restrictions to it. And then we did questions of composition, similar to the problem we just had um, earlier that was just asked. So composition of functions with the input where it's a number and composition of functions where the input is just an X and we find the domain of it. And then the last thing we did um, was that we talked about the horizontal line test. We were asking ourselves, is something one-to-one? -one? And if something's one-to-one, -one, we use a horizontal line test. We just draw a horizontal line and if it touches it at one point, then yes, it's one-to-one. -one. So it's the reverse of the vertical line test where we went vertical line, here we did horizontal line. So here we did a bunch of problems. And as we can see, when you drew a horizontal line, if it touched two spots, then the answer is no. But if it only touched one spot, right, then the answer is yes, it is one-to-one. -one. So that's where we ended off. <clears throat> and now we are gonna talk about inverse function. So we're gonna start off with number nine, and I'm gonna write, write this off on a new sheet of paper here. So now we're gonna talk about inverse functions. So you might be wondering why did we, why, what was this whole thing about one-to-one -one function? Like why, why did we have to talk about one-to-one -one functions? Why is there just drawing a line, yes or no? What's the big deal about drawing a line saying yes or no, it's one-to-one? -one? Well, one of the things is that one-to-one -one functions, like if you graphed it and it only touched, in other words, for every output, there's only one input. One-to-one -one functions have what we call inverse functions. So an inverse function, if you think of inverse, think of it as reverse, right? The word inverse is kind of like thinking reverse. So for an example, if I had a graph, and say I put a point here, and this point is two comma one, right? So two comma one is my graph, is my point, but if I want to ask you what is the inverse of two comma one, basically you reverse it. So the reverse of two comma one is one comma two. So you reverse the x's and the y's. Right? You reverse x and the y's. So two comma one, the inverse of that is one comma two, right? So here I'll then I'll put one comma two. So the reverse of something is that. So when we draw not just one point, but say I had a line, if I had a whole line that looked like this, for an example, so there's all these points on the line. So say this is, I'm just gonna put it some points here. So this is one comma one, this is um, two comma two, this is three comma three, this is um, zero comma negative one, and this is, um, negative two comma negative. I'm just kind of drawing, I'm just making up points basically. If I wanted to take the inverse of this, when I take the inverse of this, I'm gonna switch all of these things. Oh, well, you know, this is a totally bad example because three comma three is still three comma three if I reverse it, right? Two comma two is still that. Um, so what it ends up looking like is, but this is gonna reverse, right? Negative two, negative one now becomes negative one, negative two. So negative one, negative two, it's gonna look right there. Zero, negative one will become negative one, zero. So, and I'm sorry, this isn't zero, negative one. Uh, this is uh, negative one comma zero, right? Because I went negative one and I stayed at zero. So when I reverse that, it becomes zero, negative one. So zero, negative one is right here. And then I still have one, one. If I switch one, one, becomes one, one, two, one, 
if you want, right? So it looks something like that. Pretend that way. So again, the inverse is reversing the x's and the y's. So this graph here looks kind, kind of, it's a terrible example because I'm actually not using real points in the line. But the point is that you reverse everything, not just one point, but all the points on it. So they're saying that one-to-one -one functions have inverse functions. So whenever you're, so is, I would ask myself, is this one-to-one? -one? Well, if I drew a horizontal line, I would say, yes, it is one-to-one. -one. So if it is one-to-one, -one, then therefore it does have an inverse function. Not all functions have an inverse function. Um, for an example, in the problem that we just had here, this graph, if we try to find an inverse function for this, it, we, it will not have one. And we could plug in points and see why that's the case. But, um, so, but just long story short, if it's one-to-one, -one, then yes, it will have an inverse function that exists. Hmm, so now that we know what an inverse function is, it's basically switching the x's and y's, let's go ahead and look at a problem. So let's look, look at number nine here. So number nine here says, here's a G function and here's an H function. So the G function is made up of a bunch of points. A point, 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 point. The H function is a graph of a line, right? So this is line. This is a line and there are a bunch of points. So these are two functions. So they ask us first to find, I'm gonna say this is A, B, and C. These are three different questions. So the first question says to find g inverse zero. So this negative one in the exponent means inverse. So let me write this. So the notation for inverse, so if I have, if I ask you for the inverse of, so I'm gonna give you a function, say f, the letter f. So what is the notation for the inverse of f? If I wanted to find the inverse of f, so if this is f, and I wanted to say find the inverse, how I write that, so this is f of x, how I write that is that the inverse is f, and then I put a negative one on top, and then an x. So it's in, it looks like it's an exponent, but it's not an exponent, it's actually a superscript, right? So it's a superscript in terms of computer language, meaning it looks like an exponent hanging out there. So the notation for inverse of a function is, that function, and then you put a negative one on top, and then the input. Okay. So this is the notation for inverse. So when they're asking you to find the inverse, they're asking you to find the reverse of the x and the y. So here, <clears throat> in this problem, part A, they ask you, what is the inverse of g? Well, here's my g function. They ask you, what is the inverse with an input of zero. Well, now when they're asking you zero, when we normally ask for f, so I'm gonna go back to this example here. If I ask you for what is f of, if I ask you what is f of negative two in this problem, you would look at this graph and you say, well, f of negative two, if I plug negative two as an x value, this is the x value, this equals to, well, what is the y value? So the y value of this point, negative two is x, the y value is gonna be negative one, right? But now when I find its inverse, so here, when I'm saying, what is the inverse of something? The inverse then is, <clears throat> is now me, instead of saying this, the, the x value is the input, now the y value is going to be the input because, because we're switching everything. Here the input was the x value, here the input is a y value. So here if I ask you what is the input of um, negative two here, right? Well the input of negative two, so the input is negative two is the y value, so this is gonna equal to the x value, the x value is negative one. So it's the reverse. So here, this will always be the reverse. So when I look at g inverse zero, they ask me, well, what is the, what, what is going, the input is now zero. Well, the input is now the y value. It's no longer the x value because remember we're switching everything. 
So when I look at the G, when I look at the G function, I say, okay, where is it that the Y value is zero? And this is gonna equal to the X value. So we're reversing everything that we've done before. So looking at this, let me give you a chance to take a look at this. Which point has a Y value that's zero? And therefore, what would the X value be? Negative seven. Okay. And how did you get that? Can you explain? Well, from all the points, uh, that's the point, the only point that has a zero is a Y value. Okay, good. So out of all these points, the only one with a zero, with a Y value is this one. Good. Is this Vicky that's speaking? What was that? Is this Victor? No, it's Ronaldo. Ronaldo, okay. I, I can't tell, so I'm trying to guess by the voice. Ronaldo, great. So Ronaldo says zero is the Y value here, and this is linked up to the X value of negative seven. Great. So the answer is negative seven here. Is everyone okay with that? Let me ask you some other questions. Let me ask you, what is the G inverse of nine? Eight. Eight, right, and that is um, Anthony, right? Yes. The each, great, so here, there's nine is a Y value, so the answer is gonna be eight. What if I ask you, what is the G inverse of negative two? Zero. Zero. Is everyone okay with that? The Y value is negative two, so the X value is zero. What if I ask you, what is the G of three? So if I'm just asking you for the G function, I'm not asking for inverse, this is going Five. to be the X value. Good. Five. So, yes, thank you, Anthony. So the answer is five. Okay, if G of three, so without this inverse thing, this is now the X value. So this is now the X value, and now this is now the Y value. But when you're doing inverse, this is the Y value, and this is the X value. Is everyone okay with that? Any questions? All right, so now part B is a little bit harder. So now they're asking you, find H inverse of, of, or find H inverse. Well, H inverse is not a point, right? It's a whole line. How do we find H inverse? So there are steps to do that. <clears throat> so I'm gonna start a new note of pages, a new page of notes to find the inverse of a function. So how do you find the inverse of a function? So here we're going to start off with the example h of x is equal to 3x minus 13. This is example number nine, right? So to find the inverse of this, find h inverse. So again, this is what I would say is a step-by-step -step process and just take it one step at a time, right? So let's take it one step at a time. So let's look at step one. So step one is to write, so I should say rewrite as x and y's. So rewrite h of x equals 3x minus 13 as x and y's. So h of x, so replace h of x with y, right? Because that's the output. h of x is just y, right? So here, I'm just going to replace this, and I'm going to say y is equal to 3x minus 13. So I'm just rewriting it. I'm rewriting the function in terms of x and y's. So I just put a y here. So step one is easy peasy. You just do that. Step two is also easy peasy. Step two is now you switch. Switch the x's and y's. And this is why we are finding the in, this is what happens when you find the inverse of something, right? When you find the inverse of something, you switch the letters, x and y's. So here, the y goes to 3x minus 13 that I had above. I switch this now to x is equal to 3y minus 13. Is everyone okay with that? The first two steps are easy. Just switch the X and Y's, right? 
The third step is the hard step. This is the biggest step to take. This is now where you're going to solve, solve for y. In other words, you want y to be sitting by itself, right? So you want y to be sitting by itself. So right now I have x is equal to 3y minus 13. If I want y to be sitting by itself, right, I'm going to add the 13 to both sides. So I get x plus 13 is equal to 3y. Then I'm going to isolate my y. There's a coefficient there. So if you guys remember from chapter one, whenever you have a coefficient, you divide. So I'm gonna divide both sides by three to get rid of the coefficient to make it become three divided by three becomes a one. So therefore I have y is equal to x plus 13 all over three. So this one wasn't that hard. Some of them might be a little bit harder than this. You might have a quadratic, you gotta do a bunch of things, but this is a little bit simpler one of solving for y. So this becomes my y for step three. And then the last but not least, okay, so I said it was three steps, it's actually four steps, sorry. The biggest step is, is step three. This is biggest step. All the other ones are tiny dinky steps, right? The last step then is simply just to replace the letter Y with the inverse. So this answer here that you got, that is H inverse. So H inverse is, H inverse is X plus 13 all over three. Or you could write it as X over three plus 13 over three. You could break it up into two fractions. Either one is okay. Does anyone have any questions on that? All right, so I'm gonna um, have you guys do eight. Can I see the answer one more time? Sure. Is that okay? Are you gonna show us how to do C also? Yep. I just wanna make sure I'm not going too fast for you guys. Um, so this is part B, right, of this question. So H inverse right here is gonna be X plus 13 all over three. So part C, I'm gonna hold off on a part C real quick. I'm gonna hold off on that. I'm gonna actually have you guys, cause I wanna have you guys practice doing this H inverse. I'm gonna have you guys go ahead and do number 10. And this is just a warning. This is gonna be harder than what we just did. It's gonna be harder, but I just want you to try it out. Um, but, so this is number 10 here. Go ahead and try it out. And you, will, you, you might get stuck and I'll help you along with it. So part number 10, let's go ahead and do the first two steps together. Or you guys, you guys do the first two steps. I'll have you guys do that. And then the third step we'll do together. Or if you guys can know how to do it, um, go ahead and go ahead, go forward with it. I'm gonna pause this recording to give us some time to work on this. All right, so why don't you guys help me out? Step one, what did we do with step one? Anybody? Uh, don't you just equal it to y? Like, uh f of x, you just switch it to y. Great, so we just put a y there. Perfect, thank you, Anthony. Step two, what do I do in step two? You switch the symbol, which is x equals six y over y minus eight. Great, I'm sorry, who is this speaking? Stephanie. Stephanie, great, thank you, Stephanie. Any questions with what Stephanie did, switching the x and y's? Great. Third step. Solve for y. Solve for y, right? So here I'm going to put switch x's and y's. Here we um, put 
That's a bit. Well, here is we're going to solve for y. So how do we solve for y? So this is where it gets a little bit harder. What should we do first? Any thoughts on this? Get rid of the fractions. Get rid of the fractions. And how do we get rid of fractions? Can you multiply y minus 8 to both sides? Yes, we can. Great. Great idea. So let's multiply y minus 8 to both sides, and that way we get rid of the fractions. So you could think of this as a proportion, so proportion you cross multiplying, or you could think of it as multiplying by the lowest common denominator. The lowest common denominator of both sides is y minus 8. So x times y minus 8. If you multiply by y minus 8 on the right side, this erases. This becomes just 1, right? So it's equal to 6y. Sorry, I'm trying to clear this real quick. Okay. Does anyone have any questions on that? Get rid of fractions. All right. So now what do we do? We want to solve for y. What do we do next? Divide by 6. I'm sorry? Divide by 6. Divide by 6. Okay. So before we do that, what do you notice that there's is in this problem. Oh, you, uh, you distribute. Right. So whenever there's parentheses, you want to distribute. So first, we just want to make everything look pretty, right? To make everything look simplified, get rid of fractions, and then we get rid of parentheses as well. So we distribute. Good job. So here, we distribute. So I'll say get rid of parentheses. And by the way, a problem like this, I teach calculus as well. Um, we do this in calculus and I teach them how to do inverse all over again doing this too. So if you guys are going up to higher math, you will see this again. Now what? So I have a Y here and I have a Y here. What should I do? Divide six on both sides. Okay, so divide six on both sides. So that's, um, whenever we divide by something, that's normally the last step. The last step is when you want to divide by the coefficient, right? And I see you, and I see that you see that six is a coefficient of y, so I can see why you want to divide it. But before you divide it, dividing by the coefficient is always the last step. What should we do before we do that? I have a y here and a y here. What should we do? Any takers? So remember, whenever we're trying to solve for a variable, we want to gather all of our variables to one side of the equation. So all the y's are, I want all the y's to come to one side of the equation. So because there's a y here and a y here, I want all of them to come to one side and everything that does not have a y, I put it on the other side. Just like when you're solving for some variable, you just, you want all those to be standing on one side. So this x, y here, I'm going to move it over here to have it all on one side. So I'm going to subtract x, y on both sides. So when I subtract x, y, this becomes 0. This here becomes a negative 8x. 6y minus x, y, they're two different terms, so you can't combine them, so you leave it as that. So here we gather all our y's together to one side. So you gather all the y's together to one side. Is everyone okay with that? Any questions? All right, so after we gather all our y's together, we want, we want y to be sitting by itself. So we're getting closer and closer. Here, y was all over the place, and now we have all the y's together. So now you, want, you really, really want to isolate your y. So what I'm going to do is I notice that both of these have y's in it. Anyone have an idea of what we do next? Do you factor it out? Yes. You factor out your y. So again, that big F word, right? So we use factoring so much in mathematics. So if I factor out my y, what do I get on the inside? Negative 6 minus x. Good. 6 minus x. Okay. 
y times 6 will give me 6y. y times negative x will give me negative xy. I have a negative 8x is equal to y times 6 minus x. So here we factor out y. Everyone okay with that so far? Okay, last but not least is where I heard someone mention earlier that we are going to divide by the coefficient. So what is the coefficient of y in this problem? What is stuck to y that I need to get rid of? Six minus x. Right, six minus x. So I'm gonna get rid of six minus x by division, right? So we get rid of coefficients by dividing. So I'm gonna divide by six minus x, I'm gonna divide by six minus x on this side. So this becomes a one, right? So on the right side, y is finally sitting by itself. And then on the left side, I have negative eight x over six minus x. So here we divide by coefficient to isolate y. Isolate y. And there is y sitting by itself. Does anyone have any questions with this? So this is kind of tricky, but whenever you have a fraction, get rid of the fraction, get rid of parentheses, make it all look pretty, gather all your y's to one side. Once you gather it together, then, then you factor it out. And once you factor it out, you divide by the coefficient so it sits by itself. This is a very common tool that's used in mathematics. And then the Last but not least step is, what do we do next? How do I write my answer? Convert oh. back to the f negative one of x. Good. F inverse, okay. So yep, we write that y as f inverse. And that becomes your final answer. And that is finding the inverse of a function. So you can be darn sure that a problem like this will show up on a quiz and will show up on an exam. It's that important. All right. If there's no other questions, I'm going to move on to part C of that problem that we just um, went over, that we kind of skipped a little bit. So now let's go back to, so I have my paper all over the place. So. Oh, I'm sorry, let's finish this. It says answer, find the domain as well. Find the domain of F inverse. So here's F inverse. Well, let's ask you to find the domain and range of F inverse. So let's talk about this. So this is actually pretty important as well. When they ask you to find the domain and range of F inverse, so I know that my F inverse is this. So the domain, let's look at domain first. So F inverse is negative eight X over six minus X. So looking at this answer here, F inverse, I see that my answer is a fraction. What are the restrictions? What are the restrictions to a fraction? You can't have a zero. Right. The zero can never be in the denominator. So the denominator cannot equal zero. That's a restriction of all fractions. So if that's the case, then I know that six minus X cannot equal to zero, right? Six minus X cannot equal to zero. What's gonna make six minus X equal to zero? So if I wanna solve this, I could add six X to the other side. If I add X to the other side, I realize, oh, X cannot equal to six. If you plug six in here, you get six minus six is zero. And I think they asked, they just asked you to state the domain in interval notation. So is everyone okay with that the, the, the domain is X cannot equal to six? Is everyone okay with that? Any questions? All right, the denominator cannot equal to zero, and if you plug six in here, you get zero in the denominator. So the domain is that x cannot equal to six. So if I was to draw this domain, 
Here's my number six. It cannot equal to six. So I'm going to put a big open circle of six because it cannot equal to six, but everything else is okay, right? Everything else is okay to plug into this function, this inverse function. I could plug any number to the left, I could plug in any number to the right, but I cannot plug in six. If I plug in six, I'm going to get undefined. So they ask you to write this in interval notation. So if you want to write this in interval notation, well, notice there's two windows going on, a window here and a window here. So the left window is going to be, what's the left-hand side of this window? Negative infinity. Six. Yep, all the way to six. So this window here goes from negative infinity to six. And that's open brackets since it's an infinity. And six, it does not include six, so you do open bracket. So that's one window. And the second window, so union, the second window is this side here. And this window is from six to infinity. So six to infinity, which will have open brackets. So this will be the interval notation of the domain, right? Interval to notation of the domain. So the denominator cannot equal to zero, and that means the denominator cannot, the x cannot be six. So, but it could be everything else, so the interval notation is written like this. Does anyone have any questions on that? All right, so the second part of the question is asking us, what is the domain? So they're asking us, what is, I'm sorry, what is the range? So, to, so this is domain, and now let's look at range. So what is the range of F inverse? So the range, remember, are all the Y values, right? It's all the y values of a function. However, since we're talking about f inverse, so let me say this. So remember, so recall, if you have f of x and you, move, you change this to f inverse, you change it by switching the x's and y's, right? So, so follow along, this is kind of a little bit, I end up having to explain this a couple times just because I know it's a little bit confusing. So when I ask you for the, if I ask you the domain of f of x, so domain of f of x means all of the x values, right? All of the x values of the f of x, that's the domain. That's gonna equal to that's the same thing as saying the, this is the range of F inverse. Because the range of F inverse are the Y values. The range of F inverse are all the Y values. Well, all of the Y values of the range are exactly the same as the X values of the domain. So this is a big idea here. All of the y values of the inverse are the x values of the function, the normal function. And that's because when we went from f to f inverse, we had to switch the x's and y's. So all the y's here were all of the x's here. Does that make sense? So when they ask you what is the range of f inverse, the range of f inverse, that's the question here, right? What is the range of f inverse? They're asking me the question, what is the range of f inverse? Well, the only way to find out what the range of f inverse is, is to find the domain of f. Because the range means all the y values, all the y values of f inverse. Well, that's exactly the same thing as what are the x values of the domain. So when I look at the domain of f, so therefore I have to look at the f function. Well, the f function was given up here, 6x over x minus 8. So f of x, we know, was given 6x over x minus 8. This was given. 
So if I find the domain of this, then that, that will answer the question to finding the range of the F inverse. So if I ask myself, what is the domain of F? Well here, domain of F, what is my restriction here? You can use uh, six. I'm sorry? That you can use six? So, uh, try again, not six, but... How you... come it's six X over X minus eight? Um, that was the original, that was the original problem. Oh, okay. Yeah. So now we're back to talking about the function, right? Not the, not the inverse. The inverse was this, right? This oh, was... so it's, it's going to be eight? Yes, exactly. Good. Is that Ronaldo? Yes. Okay. So Ronaldo say, says that it's going to be X cannot equal to eight, right? So the function, the, the normal function, not the inverse function, we're only looking at the function now. We notice that x cannot equal to eight, right? Because the denominator cannot equal to zero. If you plug eight here, you get zero. So how do I write this in interval notation? So similar to what we did here, what is this in interval notation? So if I have a graph, here's eight, open bracket, everything to the left and everything to the right. How do I write that in interval notation? be open bracket uh, negative infinity okay uh, comma uh, eight excellent with an open bracket yep. union union open bracket eight negative uh, negative I mean positive infinity and open bracket excellent is everyone okay with what Ronaldo did yeah. Okay, so this is the domain of F. So if this is the domain of F, then this is also the range of F inverse. So this becomes your answer. They ask you, what is the range of F inverse? Well, to find that out, you find the domain of F, the domain of F of this, so therefore this is F inverse. Does anyone have any questions on that? All right, so I know it's a little bit, uh, it's the first time doing this problem is hard. And again, this is why you're gonna have homework to practice doing this over and over again. So you get good at it. And um, just be aware that I'm very likely gonna put a problem like this on your quiz and on your upcoming exam. Uh, so we'll, I have a question. So would that be the range? This is the range. This well, is the range of F inverse. It's the domain of F, but the domain of F is the, also the range of F inverse. Oh, okay. Yeah, I got it. Got it? Good. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? All right. <clears throat> okay, let me go ahead and, and do that other problem. Let's do part C of number nine. So now we know how to find inverse of functions, right? We did it with number nine and we did it number 10. Number nine, it was a little bit easier to find the, the inverse. Number 10 was a little bit harder. Part C now, they, now they're asking to find composite. So this is where the whole composite thing. So everything's coming back around with it. composite. So part C here, <clears throat> let's talk about composite functions. Part C, so in this problem here, we know we're given that h of x is equal to 3x minus 13. We found out that h inverse x, so we found out in part b that x plus 13 is all over 3, right? So we figured that out from part b. So we're given this, and this is from part b, we found out this. Now part c, they're asking us, to find h composite h inverse of negative one. <clears throat> so they're asking us to find a composite function. So if you remember what we did with composite functions, and we started off today's class with composite function, um, answering a, pr a problem from one of your classmates. So when we talk about composite functions then, 
we can rewrite this then as H, I'm sorry, do this, H on the outside, that's the outer function. On the inside is my inner function. And the inner function is always the second one, H inverse. And then the input is gonna be negative one. So I'm gonna answer this question for you in two ways. The first way is the long way. And I'm gonna show you the long way just so you can see how it's done. And then I'm gonna show you the shortcut and the shortcut is gonna take one second. So, uh, but I don't want you to just see the shortcut and accept it. I want you to see why the shortcut works based on how we do it the long way. So, so this part, you can just listen along. You take notes if you like, okay, listen along, but um, don't worry about it too much because I'm gonna show you the shortcut way, which would take you literally one second to solve it. But I want you to understand it before we solve it the shortcut way. So the long way is doing composite function, right? So composite function, first we do the inner function first. So the inner function is we plug negative one into the inverse. So here's negative one and I plug it into the inner function. If I plug negative one in here, I get, <clears throat> if I plug negative one in here, h inverse of negative one. If I plug negative one in here, I get negative one plus 13 all over three, right? Because I plug negative one in here. I get that equals to 12 over three, which equals to four. Is everyone okay with that? Any questions? So H inverse with a negative one put inside of H inverse becomes the number four. So now I have H parentheses four. So the next step now is I look at the outer function. The outer function is four. So I say, so in computer language, we say we call a function. Hey, H function, come on down. Here's the H function. H function, we're gonna call the H function and we're gonna input the number four inside the H function. So when I plug in four in here, when I plug four in here, I'm gonna get h of four. When I plug four, I get three times four, which is 12 minus 13. Three times four is 12 minus 13. So 12 minus 13, which will give us negative one. So h of four then becomes negative one. So our answer here, when it says find h composite h inverse of negative one, the answer is going to be negative one. And notice something. Notice the input negative one is equal, when you take the composite function of an, a function that's inverse, it'll equal to the same output, negative one. So this is a shortcut. So the shortcut then is notice that the input is the same as the output. That what you put in is what you get spit out when you're doing composite functions of a function and its inverse. So for an example, if I ask you another example, what is H composite H inverse of 37? What's the shortcut answer? 37. 37, right. And this is the same story if I said, what is H inverse composite H? So the order doesn't matter. When you take the composite function of an inverse and, it, and, its, and its original function, and I say of 20,000, <laughs> guess what the answer is gonna be? Twenty thousand. Excellent. And that's a shortcut. Right. So the long way is to show, to do the composite. And when you do the composite, you end up getting itself. But then the shortcut way is knowing that now that we know that, so now that we know that the shortcut is really this, that if you have a function, so I'll just call it F and you take its, its composite of its, of, of, I'll put A, the letter A, right? I mean, the number A, say A is any number, it'll always just equal to A. Or if I write it the opposite way, F negative one composite F of A, that'll also equal to A. So this is, the, this is one of the properties of a function and its inverse, is that whenever you take 
the composite function of each other, you always get itself. And that's one of the cool things about um, inverse functions. And inverse functions exist if it's one to one. If it has a one, if it's one to one, then the inverse function will exist. And if the inverse function exists, what happens is if you take its composite, the input becomes the output. And you might be wondering, okay, what, what does that have to do with why? Like, why is that important, right? Like, this is cool, but why? And this is important because of what we're going to be doing um, on Wednesday, which is we're going to be talking about, so foreshadow, is we're going to be talking about exponential functions. And then we're going to talk about log functions. So when we talk about exponential functions and log functions, these two big, big ideas, the thing is, these are inverses of each other. These are inverse functions of each other. This is Wednesday, you said, right? Um, we'll touch up on exponential log, we'll do Wednesday. Oh, yeah. okay. Exponential, we're gonna talk a little about exponential today, but we're gonna talk a lot about log on Wednesday and the relationship between the two. And the relationship between the two is that they are inverses of each other. And exponential log functions are, are phenomena that we see a lot in real life. And if you think about the COVID-19, um, they describe it as an exponential function in terms of how um, contagious it can be. Right? All right, so without further ado, 1124, I'm gonna give us about a six minute break until 1130, or six, seven minute break, 1132. Um, I'll give us a, um, about an eight minute break or so. So go ahead and take your break, go to the restroom or whatnot. Um, Hannah, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, do you want to do your, your student spotlight today? Yeah, sure. Okay. Melissa, are you here? Yeah. And are you ready to do your student spotlight? Uh, I already did mine. Oh, you did yours. Okay, maybe it's the other Melissa. Oh, okay. Is the other Melissa here? No? Okay. So Hannah- uh, I am instructor, but I haven't sent it to you yet. So oh. I don't, that wasn't me. I'm not oh, who sure. is this? Is this the other Melissa? This is Melissa Monterubio, but I didn't send, I didn't email you my spotlight yet. Oh, okay, you haven't. Do you want to do it today? No, I, I don't think I talked to you about that. I'm not sure. It wasn't me, that's for sure. I, maybe there's more than, are, is there more than two Melissas? I'm not sure. All right, so we'll have Hannah do her student spotlight. If there's anyone else that wants to do the student spotlight, go ahead and send it to me, and then after the break, we'll get to you. Um, does group eight want to, to uh, present today or on Wednesday? We could present today. Okay, group eight, we'll have to present right after the break. All righty, welcome back everyone from the break. Um, Hannah, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. All right, we're gonna start off with you with doing your um, student spotlight. So I'm going to share my screen real quick. Um, and as you guys are listening to what Hannah has to share, feel free to interact and, um, and ask her any questions that she has on what she has to share. And, and real quick, Hannah, sorry, before I start, um, are you okay with me recording this? Yeah, I'm fine with that. Okay. All right. You're up. Okay. So I'm Hannah. Um, starting with the top left picture, that is my family. Um, I'm a really big family person, so I'm constantly hanging out with them and spending time with them. Of course, right now it's a little hard because of quarantine, but we still make it happen. Um, below that picture is myself and my, my boyfriend. We've been together for like four years now. Um, so he's like my best friend. But next to that is me and my best friend. It's actually her 21st birthday today. That was us in um, Europe this last October. Um, that was the Duomo in the back and we just had the time of our lives, but it was super fun. And then next to that is me in Mammoth. I'm a really big fan of snowboarding. So um, that's like one of my hobbies. And that was last, yeah. well, it was probably a couple months ago, but sadly we couldn't snowboard after the whole quarantine. Um, Above that is a little bit of my friend group and the girls in there. Um, we're really close. We hang out all the time. I'm a really big friend person as well. Yeah. Um, 
And then the middle one is my nephew. Um, we actually have the same birthday. So we have a really close bond. Um, I'm always babysitting him, especially now with the quarantine, my sister being busy and working. Um, but yeah, he's like my best friend. We're always together and he's the cutest thing ever. Mm. But yeah, just a little bit about me and what I like to do and people I like to hang out with. Awesome. Does anyone have any comments or questions for Hannah? By the way, I think I have the same black dress as you. Okay. <laughs> where, uh, where was that in Europe? Is that Italy? Yeah. So oh. that one was in Florence. So that's like the big Duomo. I don't know if you've like seen pictures of it before, but it's huge and it's like super pretty. Yeah. If you've seen the if you've seen the Money Heist on Netflix, I don't know if anyone's watched it yet. It's like one of my favorite shows, but they filmed like a big part of it by the Duomo. So it's cool. Oh, I'm so glad you got to go before all this happened. I know it was kind of crazy to see like Italy hit with it like really hard because I was like I was just there. Right, oh. right. Sad. I actually just um, one of the things that ha happened to me from COVID that I had to cancel was a mammoth trip. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah. I know. I had the um, I had a cabin and everything. I know. My friends and I were planning on going. We all have like the Icon Pass, which is like a big snowboarding pass. Um, so it's basically free. We get to go like wherever we want when we have the pass. Oh, so gosh, we're all bummed because we're like, oh no, like season's over. So. You're really good at snowboarding, huh? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. And this season, there's so much snow. I can't believe it. I know. Everyone's like, no. So it's okay though. Next season. Next season. Yes. I actually got to go to um, Mountain High right before they closed down. And there was so much snow and it was, mm -hmm. and there weren't that many people there because at that time people were still scared. Yeah. I was so happy. At least I got one run. <laughs> one I know. Season. Yeah. Thankfully we got in a, we got in like probably five different trips at least before it closed. So good Not for you. Bad. Well, lots of good things to look forward to and hope you have a good time celebrating with your friend today. Thank you. Any other comments for Hannah? Alrighty, thank you for sharing. Um, at this point, I'm going to, let's see. I'm going to have um, group number eight from Math 130. Um, slideshow. Are you guys all here? Melissa, Marco, and Jacqueline? Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. And you guys are, oh, and is it okay if I record this? Yeah, that's fine. Are you guys okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. All right, go on ahead. Okay. Um, we did our project on the introduction of Chapter 5 AMB. So I'm Melissa. I'm Margo. I'm Jacqueline. Okay. Um, Um, so for this one, it wanted us to, the example is the function H is defined as follows, and then find H parentheses five. And then I wrote the question out, the equation out, and I multiplied five on the top and the bottom, and then solve the top and bottom, and then the answer was 25 over negative four. And then this is the example for the class to try. Would it be six over seven? Mm -hmm.
Is it six over seven? I mean, yeah, six over seven. Yeah. Okay, for this one, we're simplifying a ratio of polynomials by factoring a quadratic with the leading coefficient one. So the example shows we have u minus 6 over u to the second power minus 36. So we factor out the bottom portion and we get u minus 6 and then u plus 6. And we could cancel out u minus 6 from the top and bottom and then our answer is one over u plus six. And then this one's for the class to try. One over v minus five. Um. Yeah, you you could go to the next. Yeah. Okay, so this is our word problem. So Anne drove 320 miles using 12 gallons of gas at this rate. How many gallons would she need to drive? So what I did, I put 12 gallons over 320 miles, then equal to X over 296 miles. So you want to do cross multiply, and then you get 320 X equals 12 multiply 296, and you get 355, three, 3552, so you want to um, divide the 320x and you want to cross that out, so then you divide 3552 and you're in over 320 and you get your answer is 11.1. .1. And then you can go to the next slide. And then this one is um, you try. So Zach drove 300 miles using eight gallons of gas at this rate how many gallons of gas would he need to drive 280 miles And just for the sake of time, I'm going to move us forward. Oops, there's no answer. <laughs> there should if you move the box. What happened? Um, Is it 16.8? Yeah. OK. Sorry, I lost it for some reason. I don't know where it's at anymore. Great, so 16.8. Was there another slide after that? No, that was it. OK, perfect. All right, great job. Great job for the three ladies doing a review of functions in those areas. Does anyone have any questions or comments for them? Very nice presentation, especially with the layout. I'm noticing you guys are getting better and better at how to use your PowerPoints. How did you guys do? How did you guys put equations and everything in the PowerPoint? Um, I had to draw the, the lines for the fractions. Okay, so you drew the lines in, okay. Yeah. Um, and how did you guys, just question, wondering how you guys worked as a team, how did you guys, figure, especially working remotely, how did you guys work together to figure out to do this project? We did a Zoom call and we talked about like what we wanted to do and what chapter to review, and then we decided what problems we wanted to work on. Oh, cool. Was that hard to do, or is that pretty straightforward? I think it was like pretty straightforward. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah, it was easy. Okay. Very cool. Um, I'm going to go ahead. Any other questions or thoughts? 
All right. I have to log on to my phone again. For some reason, it erased. Um, so let me pause this. All right, so the next three problems are gonna be about exponential functions and introduction of them. Um, and we're gonna dig more into uh, exponential and log functions on, on Wednesday. But for today, we're gonna do an introduction to function, to um, an introduction to exponentials. So exponential functions, So you might think, okay, we've done exponents before, right? We had like, you know, x to the second or like three to the fourth power. These are exponents, but even though these are exponents, they're not exponential functions. So just because something has an exponent in it doesn't mean it's an exponential function. What makes something be an exponential function is when the exponent is an exponential, is an exponent, when the exponent is a variable. So for an example, if I had um, 2 to the x, 4 to the x. So these are exponential functions because the variable, the variable is the exponent. Whereas in the top in the top examples, these are numbers. So the numbers are just exponents, but an exponential function is where the the variable is an exponent. And what happens with an exponential function is that they grow really fast or they decrease really fast. So they grow and they shrink really, really fast. So um, I'm gonna show you some examples of this with um, using the worksheets that we have. So um, I know you have one worksheet. I have, I have two versions of the worksheet. So I'm gonna give you a problem here that says, um, this is not the same as one on your worksheet, but it's similar to it. But this one says graph g of x is equal to 2x. So whenever we start with something and if we want to graph it, we're just going to play detective. So to play detective, to graph something, I'm just going to plot points, right? So let's go ahead and try plotting some points. Um, let's plot in negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. Let me give you guys a second to fill that up. All right, now that I've given you guys a chance to fill out this table, because we're just gonna investigate to find out what does this graph look like. Notice that this is an exponential function. The variable is in the exponent. So that's what makes it an exponential function. So here, negative two. Um, Anthony, if you plugged in negative two in here, what did you get? Uh, that would be negative four, right? Let's try that. So let's see if we plugged in negative two in here. I get two to the negative two, right? Or positive four. Try again. So if I have a negative exponent, what do I do with the number? Do you guys remember? How do you get rid of a negative exponent? This was a few chapters ago, so I know it's a little bit. Remember, you, you, we do not want a negative exponent. What does the negative exponent rule say? Anyone at all? So to get rid of the negative exponent, you bring the two to the bottom. You guys remember that? So the two now goes downstairs to make it a positive exponent two. So when you have something that's negative exponent, you make it you make a positive exponent by bringing the base down to the bottom and changing the exponent to positive. So that becomes one over four. Is everyone okay with that? Is that okay, Anthony? Yeah, that makes sense. I forgot that rule. No worries, I think a lot of us forgot. So to plot this negative two, one fourth, I'm gonna go negative two to the left and then one fourth is barely above the line, right? So there's negative two, one fourth. Negative one. Um, how about Melissa Santiago? What, did you get anything for negative one? Uh, 
um, one. Try again. So if you plug negative one into the exponent, we get two to the negative one. Ready? How do you make the negative exponent go away? You move it to the bottom. Move it to the bottom. So what do we get when you move it to the bottom? What do you get when you move two to the bottom? Mm -hmm. Professor, are you on the right, the right? Um, oh, the sorry, table? are you not being able to see me? I just have, for number 11, I just have a different problem. Oh, than that, so. oh you can do this. No, I'm on a different one. Yeah, this is a different one. I wanted to do this one first before we go to the one that you guys have. Oh, okay, I see. Good question, this is a different one. So two to the negative one, can anyone help? One over two. Yep, one over two. Because one over two to the positive one is just one over one half. Is everyone okay with that? So negative one here, I put one half, so now I'm halfway up. So I went up a tiny, tiny little bit, right? I took a step to the right and I went a tiny step up. Zero, what happens when you plug zero into this exponent? Um, just pre, can you help me out? And if you're not sure, you can just say so too, that's fine. Just pre, are you there? Would it be one? Yep, it'll be one. So two to the zero power is just equal to one. So at zero, we go up to two. Oh, I'm sorry, not two, one, one, right there. Not this, my bad. So at zero, we go up to one. Okay, now hopefully we go a little bit faster now. Um, Paul, can you help me out? What do I get when I plug in one? Uh, two. Good, so we plug in one in here, the answer is just two. So one here, I'm at two. So now I'm going up a little bit more. Um, how about Sophia? When I plug in two, what do I end up getting? Four. Four, great. So two squared gives you four. So two here gives you four. Let's just choose something way out here. What if I put in the number, um, let's put in the number six. So something just a little bit more to the right, two to the sixth. I don't have a calculator, what's two to the sixth power? 64. 64. Right? So two to the six power shoots way, way up that I can't even put it in here. It's like way, way up here. I can't even put it in, right? So as you can see, if I connect the dots here, notice, right? And this, if I put more down here, it'll keep going down, down, down. So notice what an exponential function does. It grows a little by little, but as it gets, but very, very quickly, it shoots up super duper high. So this is what we call an exponential growth. An exponential growth function is where it's growing from left to right, it's growing. And that happens, so if you have a function that looks like this, this is an exponential growth, the letter A is the base, right? A represents any number, so here this number is two. So if A is a number that is bigger than one, if A is bigger than one, it's gonna be an exponential growth. It's gonna go this way. But what happens if A is less than one? So let's look at the question that you guys have. So the question you guys have is <clears throat> number 11 right here. So notice here, this exponential growth, or I'm sorry, exponential function, there's a variable in the exponent. And notice now that for f of x is equal to a to the x, notice that your base a in this problem is less than one. So what happens if a is less than one? Do you guys have any um, predictions of what happens if a is less than one? It will go down. Yep, it'll be an exponential, what we call exponential, instead of an exponential growth, it'll be an exponential decay function. And specifically, 
Um, and the A can never be negative, it'll always be a positive number. So we'll just say that when A is between zero and one, when it's a fraction between zero and one. So let's go ahead and investigate this phenomenon. So you have X and Y. So let's plug in the simpler points, negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. So let's do this one together. And hopefully we go a little bit faster. Um, Stephanie, can you help me? We'll, we'll just walk me through what you would do to find out to do this first one. What would you do? You don't have to know the right answer, just what would you do? Um, I'll multiply two and negative two two times, which I'll get So before you do that, right, so because I know you're, you're raising to the second power, the negative two power, if it's a negative exponent, what do you do with the negative exponent? Would you switch it? Yep, you switch it. So two fifth would now become? Five, five over two? Five over two squared, great. So now it becomes five over two because you switch the the base, because it was a negative exponent, becomes 5 half. So what's 5 half squared? 25. 25 over? 4. 4. 25 over 4, that's about, what is that? 6 point something, right? It's 6 point something, right? So here, when I graph this, I have negative 2, and I'm, on, I'm at 6 point something. So it's not going to be exactly be somewhere here. Six point something, right? Let's plug in negative one. So um, let me see who else is in here. Um, Hannah, are you there? Hannah, what would I get if I plugged in negative one into here? Why don't you walk me through that? And Hannah's not there. How about Ashley? Oh, I see you're trying to connect to the audio. Um, how about Paul? Um, is it just five over two? Great, and how did you get five over two? I just did the switch and made it an uh, uh, exponent of one and um, there's nothing you do other than multiply it by one. Great, five half, right, good. So five half is the same thing as 2.5, right? So if I plug negative one in, I get 2.5. So somewhere right here. Great. And then zero, what happens when I plug in zero? Anybody? What's two fifth to the zero power? Isn't it zero? Try again, you're close. One. One, one. right. So anything to the zero power is always one. So zero, one. And then two fifth to the first power, just give me two fifth. So one here, I'm at two, it's only super small, right? And then at two, if I plug two fifth squared, anybody, what do I get when I plug two fifth squared? Four over 25? Great, four over 25. So something really close to zero, right? So here I have some four over 25. So here, now if I connect the dots, notice that my graph looks something like this. And it'll never pass the x-axis, it'll just go closer and closer to zero. But notice how it, went, it shot super high and then it decreased really fast. So this is called an exponential decay function. So great job guys, so we have an exponential growth function, and then a growth function is when your a, your base is bigger than one, and an exponential decay is when it's between zero and one, when it's a, when it's a fraction between zero and one, um, you'll see that go, goes really slow. So these two phenomena, um, a growth function and, an, and a decay function, there's a lot of things in, uh, in real life that grows really fast or decreases really fast. What are some examples of things that you think grow like who that grows exponentially the like infectious diseases okay right infectious diseases right 
Anything else? Um, social media is a phenomenon that grows really fast. You have a friend one day, your friend has two friends, those two friends have two other friends, those friends have two, and it keeps growing, growing. So when you start off at one day, by the day five or six, you'll be connected to like, you know, dozens of people by day five or six. By day 10, 11, you'll be connected to hundreds of people. So that's how social media works as well. I was gonna say weather. Mm -hmm. Like the weather, like humidity, temperature, things like that, rise and fall. Okay, so maybe weather can grow really, really fast, right? The rise and fall of it. All right. How about exponential decay? What do you think in real life decay is like that? Uh, if, well, I mean, if someone parachutes, I guess, or free falls. Mm. How fast they're falling, right? I never thought of that. One of the things in um, science, when we talk about exponential decay functions, is in a radioactive decay. So any of you guys that are going to chemistry or physics, um, radioactive decay models this. It decays like this. All right, one other thing that none of you guys mentioned yet, exponential growth, something that grows really fast, and you might be happy to hear this, is money, is investments. Also, what grows really fast is debt. So on the flip side, the debt that you accumulate because of interest being compounded. Like, so you might buy something for $100, and by the time you're done paying it off, you pay $400 for it, right? And that's because of interest is being compounded every year when you that's why credit card companies um, um really aim towards young college students to sign up for credit cards because they try to get you in that trap of end up paying more than what you originally bought something for however on the flip side on the positive end um, money grows exponentially when you invest it so here let's take a look at number 12 oh no your your number 12 Suppose Aldo places $9,500 in an account that pays 13% interest compounded each year. Assume that no withdrawals are made from the account. So this will show you that it's better to put your money and invest your money in an account than to um, put it underneath your pillow or bury it in your backyard. Um, it'll show you that actually you make money by investing your money into accounts that have interest in it. And especially when they're being interest is being compounded and compound means it's being accrued every year every year they calculate the interest and they add that money into your account the interest and then the following year your uh, they add more money to your account based on the accrued the sum of all the money that's in there so assume no withdrawals are being made follow the instructions below do not do any rounding part a Find the amount in the account at the end of one year. So how much will Aldo have after putting his account in there after one year and then after two years? So compound it each year. So here, let's talk about compound interest. So I'm gonna start off a new page and I think we have about 25 minutes, which is perfect. So my favorite topic is about compound, is about money, compound interest. So compound interest, so the formula, so first of all, let me just give you the formula. The formula is A, which is the amount at the end of so much time, is equal to P. P is the principal amount, or the amount that you first started off with in terms of investment, times one plus R, R is the interest rate, divided by n, the n is the number of times that the interest is being compounded a year, and then t is the number of years you're investing the money. So let me write down everything I said. A is the final amount after t years. So A is the final amount of money, 
after so many years. P is the principal or the initial amount that you first started off with. So this is P is a dollar sign. The R, let me give you some time to write that. Do you guys remember what R was? Interest rate. Great, the interest rate. The interest rate, and we're gonna change it to a decimal. So remember to, to always write R as an interest rate, as a decimal. Did anyone remember what N was? So N is a number of times that you're compounding the interest per year, or number of times that the money's being compounded in a year. So sometimes the interest is calculated once a year. So if it was only once a year, so they, if they just say annually, if they say it was a, an annual com compound, then your N would equal to what? One. Good, one. Annual means it's only done once a year. If they said it was semi-annual, semi-annual, what do you think N is gonna be? Two. Two, right. And if they say quarterly, what is N? Four. Right. Monthly? Twelve. Well, um, daily, what's the normal daily amount that we would normally put if it's not a leap year? How many days are there in a year? 356. Close. 365. 365, right. How about weekly? How many weeks are there in a year? 52. 52, right. So again, it depends on how they say it, then your N will be something different, right? And maybe they'll tell you N is 10. Maybe they'll just tell you straight out. Otherwise, if they use these words, you'll know what N is. So depending on the count, some accounts are compounded many times a year, and some accounts they're only compounded just once a year, right? So it depends on the account. T, what does T stand for? Total time in years. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's a time in years. Great. So it's how many time, how many how many years have you invested your money in that account, right? The total time, right? Great. So these are what all these letters stand for. And yes, you do have to memorize this. So here in this problem, uh, where are you? In this problem here, it says find the amount in the account at the end of a year. So first of all, let's create that equation. Let's go ahead and plug things into this equation, this formula, I mean. Okay, let me give you guys some, a moment to go ahead and write down what you think each letter stands for and plug it in. Um, Jaspreet, are you there? I'm not hearing you for some reason. Um, how about Victor, help me out. What did you get for A, Victor? Oh, I'm just kidding, A is what we're trying to find. What did you get for P? Uh, 9,500. Great, so 9,500 is the initial amount, great, times one plus R, um, how about Kent, help me out. What'd you get for R? Kent, can you hear me? All right, then Victor, I'm just gonna have you continue then if you don't mind. What'd you get for R? Uh, well, it's 13%, right? Yep. So how do you change 13% to a decimal? You would move the decimal point 
two to the left, so it would be 0.13, I believe. Great, 0.13, perfect. 0.13 is R divided by N. What is N? I'm trying to see where it says, I think. Would it be one? It's one, good. So yeah. Each year. each year means annually, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, good. And then one times T, so one multiplied by T, and what is, so part A, T is going to be? One, I, one. I assume. Just one. So this X one here is just one for this problem, right? Because at the end of one year. So this means just plugging this into your calculator. Oh, okay, I see. When you plug this into your calculator, you get 9,500. 1 plus 0.13 over 1 is just 1.13. Go ahead and plug that into your calculator. So plug it in, plug it in. Anyone get an answer for part one? Would it be 10,735? What is it? 10,000 what? 735. Okay, Where's the, were there any cents part of that? Were there any um, decimals? I don't think so. No, I don't care any Does that agree? agree? Yes. Perfect. All right, so that's, so notice, if you start off with 90, all just start off with $9,500, he put his account in the bank, and then by the end of the year, he made 10,000, the the account is worth $10,735. That's because of interest. Isn't that awesome? Part B, what happens after two years? So what do we change now? If it's two years, what do we put in? Do we just change the exponent? Yep, we change the exponent to what a what a? To two. To two, good. Go ahead and plug that in. Remember, order of operations, do exponents first. So 1.13 squared, and then multiply by 9,500. So remember, order of operations. Anyone get an answer? Uh. 12,130 with 55 cents. Okay. I don't have my calculator in front of me, so I'm going to just um, trust on your answer, Anthony. Do you guys agree with Anthony or do you guys get anything different? Yes, I got the same answer. Yeah, I did too. Great. So after two years, notice how much, notice the growth in his account. And this is called exponential growth, right? Because it's Notice that the exponent is a variable, it's t, right? So it grows, 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 grows. So whatever number you put into t will cause it to grow exponentially. All right, let's look at the last problem here, number 13. Great job with that, you guys. Okay, number 13, this is... Here we go, this is what you guys have. Okay, suppose that $2,000 is invested at a rate of 4.4% compounded quarterly this time. Assuming no withdrawals are made, find the total amount after seven years. Do not round any intermediate computations and round your answer to the nearest cent. So let me give you guys a moment to try doing that. So let's go ahead and um, A is equal to P times one plus R over N the MT. Let me give you guys a chance to do that. All righty. Um, any volunteers help me out with this problem? Or I could just call on someone. Kent, is your audio working? 
Okay. Kent's audio is not working. No problem. Um, Paul, I think your audio is working, right? Uh, yeah, but I'm still working on it. <laughs> All right. Let's work on it together. Okay. So what, what have you filled out so far? What do you know so far? Give uh, me um, I have uh, 2,000 as the principal. Okay. So 2,000 is the principal. All right. So the amount equals the principal times one plus, uh, I put 4.4 4 as the decimal of the 4.4%. 4. Okay, that's where um, maybe a little bit wrong. So I'm four, sorry, four, uh, point four four. Good. So point, point what? Four four. Point four four? Yeah. Try yeah. Point zero four four. Oh, is it point zero? Yeah. So be careful with the decimals here. You want to move the decimal twice to the left. Oh. Yeah. Good. Um, the, the divided by 12. Okay. So where did you get the number 12? Uh, I thought it said quarter. Oh, I'm sorry. It should have been four. <laughs> good, good. So quarterly means four. Great. That was really off on this one. Good. Um, and then it would be over a period of seven years. So that would be the exponent. Okay. Exponent. Seven. What else are you missing in the exponent? One more thing. Um, Notice that the X one is N times T, right? So N is four, right? Oh, okay. So it'd be four T? Four times seven. Okay. So N is going to be four. T is going to be seven years. So, okay. is everyone okay with what Paul did? Is everyone okay with getting this? So for setting it up. Does anyone have any questions? All right, so let's talk about order of operations. What should I do first? I'm gonna go ahead and divide first. Okay. Divide the 0 0.044 by four. Okay, divide 0 0.044 divided by four. And add the one. And add the one. Okay, so we're gonna do that first. So what do you get when you, when you do that on your calculator? Um, Paul or anybody else it doesn't have to just be Paul. Is it one point zero one one? One point zero one one. Do you guys get that? Sorry, I don't have a calculator on me, so I'm kind of. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I got that. All right, great. And then the exponent four times seven is twenty-eight. Twenty-eight. Yeah. Good. Good. Now, what do we do? Um, I'm not sure how to do the how to do the multiplication of the exponent right now, but I think that's what you do next, isn't it? Yep, good. So next thing we do is the exponent. So remember, order of operations, please, parentheses, excuse, exponent. So we're going to do exponents next. So put 1.011 and then raise it to the 28th power. So there should be a caret sign on your calculator. Do you guys know how to do the I'm sorry, I got someone at my door, man. No worries. Does, do any of you guys know how to do this 1.011 raise? Oh, can't I see your message? 1.011 raise to the 28th power. Anyone get an answer for that? Uh, 1.3584 1465. Like that? Yeah. Okay. So we get that huge answer, and then now we're gonna, thank you. Anyone have any questions with that? And then you're gonna multiply with that with 2,000. So we multiply that with 2,000, what do we end up getting? 2,716.8, since it says round to the nearest cent. So nearest cent means two decimals. Um, oh, okay, then it'll be 83.83. Good, great. Yeah, so when it says round it to the nearest cent, Round it to two decimals because that's how we do it with the English sense, right? So notice um, this person put something in for, for at two thousand dollars, and after even at a very small interest rate, four point four percent, after seven years, and when it's compounded four times a year, 
you end up getting $2,716.83. Does anyone have any questions with that problem? Everyone okay? All right. So that's the final answer? I'm sorry? Yes, that's the final answer. Okay. Right. So great job, everyone. So the exponential functions, this is where we're getting into um, some kind of fun stuff of some application of the things that you guys have been learning about. Exponential functions are things that grow really fast and things that decrease really slowly, um, or decrease really fastly, I'm sorry. Um, fastly, is that a word? Quickly. Um, so in the next section, we're gonna talk about log functions. So log functions, I call them, I call like the brother or sister of exponential functions. They're the inverse function of exponents. So today we learned a lot about inverse functions. We learned how to find it. Um, what is one-to-one? -one? We learned um, how to find the shortcut of, of it when we asked for the composite functions of it. So we learned a lot about all that. We're done with that now. We're just starting off on exponents. This is homework is gonna be due tomorrow night at midnight. So there's only 13 topics. So hopefully you guys are almost done with it already. If you guys have any questions, Garrett, I don't know why he's not here right now, but he should be on Discord if you guys need to um, get a, a hold of him. Um, you know, so this will be due Tuesday night. And then on Wednesday, I'm gonna put up another worksheet. And that worksheet is gonna be about log functions. And once we get into log functions, um, this is, log functions is very new to a lot of students so this is it, it feels challenging because it's new but it's actually really fun as well um challenging but fun um anyways thank you guys for joining me 12 26 p.m um i'll let you guys off a little bit early i'll be on here for another 10 minutes if any of you guys have any questions on anything else